Psychiatric therapy is used to study, diagnose, treat and in some cases prevent mental disorders. Nowadays they're mostly harmless and can be quite effective, but it hasn't always been that way. From putting you in a coma to injecting malaria infected blood, join us as we count 10 strange outdated psychiatric treatments. Number 10. Insulin Coma Therapy The coma therapy trend began in 1927. Viennese physician Manfred Sackel accidentally gave one of his diabetic patients an insulin overdose and it sent her into a coma. But what could have been a major medical disaster turned into a triumph. The woman, a drug addict, woke up and declared her morphine craving gone. Dan Sackle made the same mistake with another patient who also woke up claiming to be cured. Somehow I'm not totally convinced that the second one was accidental. Before long, Sackle was intentionally testing the therapy with other patients and reporting a 90% recovery rate, particularly among schizophrenics. Strangely, however, Sackle's treatment success remains a mystery. Presumably, a big dose of insulin causes blood sugar levels to plummet, which starves the brain of food and sends the patient into a coma. But why this unconscious state would help psychiatric patients is anyone's guess. Regardless, the popularity of insulin therapy faded, mainly because it was dangerous. As it turns out, slipping into a coma is no walk in the park, and between 1 and 2% of treated patients died as a result. Number 9. Trepanation There were multiple ways in ancient life that one could obtain a hole in their head. From wars to drunken duels to occasionally wrestling a wild pig, there are many possible explanations. But not all holes are created with equal abandon. Through the years, archaeologists have uncovered skulls marked by a carefully cut out circular gap which shows signs of being made long before the owner of the head passed away. These fractures were no accident. They were the result of one of the earliest forms of psychiatric treatment, called trepanation. The basic theory behind this therapy holds that insanity is caused by demons lurking inside the skull. Boring a hole in the patient's head creates a door through which the demons can escape, and voila, out goes the crazy. Despite the strangeness of this so-called therapy and the lack of serious anaesthetics back then, trepanation was by no means a rare occurrence. From the Neolithic era to the early 20th century, cultures all over the world used it as a way to cure patients of their ills. Doctors eventually phased out the practice as less, how shall I put, invasive procedures were developed. Average Joes, on the other hand, didn't follow suit. Trepanation patrons still exist. In fact, they even have their own organizations and websites. Check out the International Trepanation Advocacy Group at www.trepan.com if you're curious or insane. Number 8. Rotational Therapy Charles Darwin's grandfather Erasmus Darwin was a physician, philosopher and scientist, but unfortunately he wasn't particularly good at any of these. Therefore, his ideas were not always taken seriously, which could be because his theories were a bit far-fetched, such as his spinning couch treatment. Darwin's logic was that sleep could cure disease and that spinning around really fast is a great way to induce the slumber. Nobody paid much attention to this at first, but later, American physician Benjamin Rush adapted the treatment for psychiatric purposes. He believed that spinning would reduce brain congestion and in turn cure mental illness. He was wrong. Instead, Rush just ended up with dizzy patients who were still crazy. These days, rotating chairs are limited to the study of vertigo and space sickness. Number 7. Hydrotherapy Building off the idea that a dip in water is often calming, early psychiatrists attempted to remedy various symptoms with corresponding liquid treatments. For example, hyperactive patients got a warm, tiring bath, while lethargic patients received stimulating sprays. Some doctors, however, got a bit too zealous about the idea, prescribing therapies that sounded more like punishment. One treatment involved mummifying the patient in towels soaked in ice-cold water. Another required the patient to remain continuously submerged in a bath for hours or even days, which might not sound so bad, except they were strapped in and only allowed out to use the restroom. And think how soggy their skin must have become. Ugh. Finally, some doctors ordered the use of high-pressure jets. Sources indicate that at least one patient was strapped to the wall in a crucifixion position and blasted with water from a fire hose. Like many extreme treatments, hydrotherapy was eventually replaced with psychiatric drugs, which tended to be a bit more effective and more pleasant. Number 6. 
mesmerism. Franz Mesmer believed that an invisible force pervaded everything in existence and that disruptions in this force caused pain and suffering. His basic theory was that the gravity of the moon affected the body's fluids much in the same way as it caused ocean tides and that some diseases accordingly waxed and waned with the phases of the moon. The dilemma then was to uncover what could be done about gravity's pernicious effects. Mesmer's solution? Use magnets. Yeah, bitch! Magnets! Oh! After all, gravity and magnetism were both about objects being attracted to each other. Thus, placing magnets on certain areas of a patient's body might be able to counteract and disrupt influence of the moon's gravity and restore the normal flow of bodily fluids. Surprisingly, many patients praised the treatment as a miracle cure, but the medical community dismissed it as a superstitious nonsense and chalked up his treatment successes to the placebo effect. Mesmer and his theories were ultimately discredited, but he still left his mark. Today, he's considered the father of modern hypnosis because of his inadvertent discovery of the power of suggestion, and his name lives on in the English word mesmerize. Number 5. Malaria Therapy Ah, if only we're talking about a therapy for malaria. Instead, this is malaria as therapy. Specifically, as a treatment for syphilis, there was no cure for the STD until the early 1900s when Viennese neurologist Wagner von Jauregg got the idea to treat syphilis sufferers with malaria-infected blood. Predictably, these patients would develop the disease, which would cause an extremely high fever that would kill the syphilis bacteria. Once that happened, they were given the malaria drug quinine, cured and sent home happily and healthily. The treatment did have its share of side effects, that nasty sustained fever for one, but it worked and it was a whole lot better than dying. In fact, von Jauregg won the Nobel Prize for malaria therapy and the treatment remained in use until the development of penicillin came along and gave doctors a better, safer way to cure the STD. Number 4. Chemically Induced Seizures I'm going to have to wing the pronunciation of this one, which means I'll probably screw it up. Hungarian pathologist Ladislas von Majuna pioneered the idea of seizure therapy. He reasoned that because schizophrenia was rare in epileptics, and because epileptics seemed blissfully happy after seizures, then giving schizophrenic seizures would make them calmer. In order to do this, von Meduna tested numerous seizure-inducing drugs, including strychnine, caffeine and absinthe before settling on metrazole, a chemical that stimulates the circulatory and respiratory systems. And although he claimed the treatments cured the majority of his patients, opponents argued that his methods were dangerous and poorly understood. To this day, no one is quite clear on why seizures can help ease someone's schizophrenic symptoms, but many scientists believe the convulsions release chemicals otherwise lacking in a patients' brains. Ultimately, the side effects, including fractured bones and memory loss, turned away both doctors and patients. Number 3. Hysteria Therapy Once upon a time, women suffering from pretty much any type of mental illness were lumped together as victims of hysteria. The Greek physician Hippocrates popularized the term, believing hysteria encompassed conditions ranging from nervousness to fainting fits to spontaneous muteness. The root cause, according to him, was a wandering womb. He claimed that this is the uterus, remains unfruitful long beyond its proper time, it gets discontented and angry and wanders in every direction through the body, closes up the passages of breath and by obstructing respiration drives women to extremity. Consequently, cures for hysteria involved finding a way to calm down the uterus, and while there were plenty of methods for doing this, including holding foul-smelling substances under the patient's nose to drive the uterus away from the chest, Plato believed that the only surefire way to solve the problem was to get married and have babies. After all, the uterus always ended up in the right place when it came time to bear a child. Although womb calming as a psychiatric treatment died out long ago, hysteria as a diagnosis hung around until the 20th century when doctors began identifying conditions such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and phobias. Number 2 Phrenology Around the turn of the 19th century, German physician Franz Gall developed phrenology, a practice based on the idea that people's personalities are depicted in the bumps and depressions of their skulls. Basically, Gall believed that parts of the brain a person used more often would get bigger, 
like muscles. Consequently, these pumped up areas would take up more skull space, leaving visible bumps in those places on your head. Gull then tried to determine which parts of the skull corresponded to which traits. For instance, bumps over the ears meant you were destructive, a ridge at the top of the head indicated benevolence, and thick folds on the back of the neck were signs of sexually oriented personalities. In the end, phrenologists did little to make their mark in the medical field, as they couldn't treat personality issues, only diagnose them, and incorrectly at that. By the early 1900s, phrenology had waned and modern neuroscience had gone a dominion over the brain. Number 1 Lobotomy Everybody's favourite psychiatric treatment, the modern lobotomy was the brainchild of Agas Moniz, a Portuguese doctor. Moniz believed that mental illnesses were generally caused by problems in the neurons of the frontal lobe, the part of the brain just behind the forehead. So when he heard about a monkey whose violent feces throwing urges had been stopped by a cut to the frontal lobe, Moniz was moved to try out the same thing on his patients. The lobe cutting, not the feces throwing. He believed the techniques could cure insanity, while leaving the rest of the patient's mental function relatively normal, and his research seemed to support that. The accolades flooded in, and Moniz was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1949. After the lobotomy rage hit American shores, Dr. Walter Freeman took to travelling the country in his lobotomobile. No, that's not a joke. Performing the technique on everyone from catatonic schizophrenics to disaffected housewives, his road-ready procedure involved inserting a small ice pick into the brain through the eye socket and wiggle it around a bit. While some doctors thought he's found a way to save hopeless cases from the horrors of lifelong institutionalization, others noted that Freeman didn't bother with sterile techniques and had no surgical training whatsoever and tended to be a bit imprecise when describing his patient's recovery. As the number of lobotomies increased, a major problem became apparent. The patients weren't just calm, they were virtual zombies who scarcely responded to the world around them. Between that and the bad press received in films and novels such as One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the treatment soon fell out of favour. 